Good morning. Welcome to the graduation equity webinar series. I am Kefi Anderson. I'm a system improvement program supervisor lead. And today we're going to be talking about educator and staff wellness. This meeting is being recorded and it should be available pretty much immediately on YouTube. We're streaming it today. Um, we do have closed captions available. Uh, so if you want to take advantage of that, they're there. Um, we're going to drop the PowerPoint into the chat in just a few minutes. Um, but it's also going to be posted on the Graduation Equity webinar page. So if you want to follow along, you can. This webinar is brought to you through the Office of Student Engagement and Supports uh, within the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. At OSPI, we believe each student needs to be prepared for post-secondary pathways, careers, and civic engagement. The Graduation Equity Webinar Series was created with the purpose of highlighting practices that increase access to education and ultimately to graduation. Through our webinars, uh, we're striving to go beyond equality. We want to think about opportunities we have to examine and dismantle current policies and practices that result in disparate outcomes for our students. Um, we want to acknowledge historical context and engage our students, families, and communities as partners in decision making to create the kind of schools we know kids will thrive in. I want to share with you this ancestral lands overlapping map, and I hope that the colors bring you some springtime joy as we welcome the light back. Uh, if you go to the link in our resources sheet coming up, uh, each area will light up for you. It's a great map to look at. Uh, we ask that the participants of this meeting honor the traditional lands on which each of you are located today, and um, we'll get you some links to help you with that if you need them. Um, in my life, I mostly travel around the intersection of the traditional lands of the Squaxin Island, Coast Salish, Cowlitz, and Nisqually tribes. And I'd like to acknowledge the indigenous people who have stewarded this land since time immemorial and who still live here today. And just to put a shout out um, out there for tribal consultation, uh, it is a really great way to get to know your local tribes and begin those relationships that benefit students and their families. Uh, and if you'd like to know more about it, we would love to connect you with our Office of Native Education. Um, I'd like to take a moment to center our work around equity. Uh, educators are often deprived of rest, uh, and it's a racial and social justice issue that I want to bring to you today. Um, part of grind culture is to work long hours, to show up early and to leave late, uh, to brag over Sundays spent working, to never take a day off, um, and that makes you indispensable, right? And so that culture can really wear not only on teachers, but on students too. And we all need rest. Uh, and I'm not just talking about sick days, but also sleep, leisure, and mental health. Uh, just as it's hard for students to learn when they're tired, it's hard to teach when you're feeling tired too. Uh, and people are consistently, when people are consistently tired, they get burned out. We're seeing this with our educator staff across the state, across country and that people are so tired that they're leaving the profession. And I know, um, and I'm sure that you do too, that there's a systems element to creating a culture where you get what you need when you need it. Uh, and I wanna take a breath to collectively reimagine an alternative. So what would it take for us to slow down? What would it take for us to create reasonable schedules and workloads? Um, what would make it feel okay to rest? And uh, I hope that this presentation gives you some ideas and encourages you to make some suggestions and ask people some good questions. We chose to talk about educator and staff wellness today because we know that the last couple of years have been especially difficult for our school staff and educators. And there's a lot of pressure 
to deliver content that's more engaging, more integrated, more socially, emotionally driven to students um, who are struggling to readjust to school. And all of this in the midst of a collective trauma experience that might leave you feeling drained, mourning a loved one, uh, concerned for your safety. And although we can't solve it all today, uh, we're hoping that you'll find this presentation valuable. We hope you'll get a chance to think about your why around educator and adult well-being in schools and um, that you can be able to start to incorporate systems and community level care alongside self-care and that we can provide you with some resources to support school well-being for all. Um, I brought with me Bridget Underdahl. She is our OSPI program supervisor for Project AWARE. She's been inspired by educator, author, and Dean uh, Dwayne Reed from the Chicago Public School System, as well as by work done in Highline Public Schools with Mikey and Associates, including Michelle Mikey and Megan Osborne, as well as Sophie DeHaan, who serves as a behavioral health systems navigator. We are so glad that y'all could be here today. I'm super excited to learn from you. Um, but first, uh, we'd like to get to know you. Uh, we are always curious about our audience. So if you're willing to tell us a little bit about you, um, we're gonna launch this poll and see who is here. And we're going to get you some slides in the chat as well and uh, our resources sheet. Oh, and Bobby, I see you. The first time you create boundaries, it feels weird. The first time you say no, it feels weird. But just like all the learning, as you practice it, it becomes easier. That is so true. Thank you, Bobby. And yes, take those mental health days. More money to hire more staff. Mm -hmm. Love these thoughts, y'all. And yeah, if your um, position isn't listed in the poll, uh, feel free to tell us in the chat too. And it looks like we've got about 73% participation at this point. So I'm going to end the poll. And if you didn't get to participate, don't worry, you'll get another chance. It's OK. And I'll share these results with you. So it looks like in our audience, we have a lot of school counselors, school psychologists, community liaisons, attendance liaisons, grad specialist type folks. And we've got um, a wide variety of district office ESD OSPI staff with us as well and administrators are our next highest category. And um, there's a lot of people I know who watch this on the back end who are teachers. So teachers, we see you too. Um, and uh, a lot of the folks in the audience are in the middle or high school level. And most people are somewhat familiar with this topic of self-care. So I think we can go deep and share some, some more nuanced ideas today. Thank you for participating in the poll. Uh, next up, we'll have Bridget Underdahl, and she'll be sharing with you her perspective from OSPI's Project AWARE. Project AWARE is um, a grant from Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, uh, SAMHSA, uh, that focuses on improving school climate, safety, and substance abuse prevention through increased collaboration based on a multi-tiered system of supports, MTSS. Uh, welcome, Bridget. Thank you so much. Again, I'm Bridget Underdahl. I'm honored to be here with you today. I'm coming from the traditional lands of the Squawks and Island people. And like Kefi said, I'm the program supervisor for Project AWARE here at OSPI. It's a federal-based mental health grant. And I was actually an early childhood educator for 10 years and then a Washington State Public School educator for additional 10 years. So this is a topic of conversation near and dear to my heart that I'm very passionate about. And I'm gonna give you some context to our conversation that we're gonna to have today. 
So what I get to do with a brief amount of my time uh, in the job that I'm honored to be doing is Freedom Dream. And what that means is when we're shooting for the stars, what's that best possible scenario we're hoping to build? What are the values associated with it? And what are some of those step-by-step -step ways that we actually get there? So what we're thinking about today, what do schools that practice communal care look like? How do we incorporate the adults in each school into social emotional learning protocols? How do we use our multi-tiered systems of support frameworks to honor adult mental health and well-being? What role does self-care play alongside communal care and systems level care? And how do we honor all of that in our schools? I think about this quote quite often in the work I do, and especially in educator and staff wellness. Marion Kaba said, hope is a discipline. And this has almost become a mantra to me in that it, it's quite often for us to think about hope is if we could just be more positive people, it should come naturally or um, even leading into toxic positivity because um, it, it would seem like a better space to be in. But hope as a discipline tells us that hope takes actual work and daily practice, just like a mindfulness practice or daily exercise. It's something we work on consistently and it's associated with goals and pathways that have value to us. So again, I think about this quote quite often in the work of educator and staff wellness. And my wish is that this quote will be meaningful to you as well as we have this conversation. And I have a few pieces of data for you that connect to this topic that we're speaking on today. So this is a national data source. And in November, 2021, the educators that were polled, 48% um, reported that they had considered quitting within the last 30 days. And what I particularly, what resonated with me from this national data piece was this portion. Superintendents and leaders were asked, what percent of teachers quitting would create a cataclysmic drop in your organization's ability to educate young people? And the quote that really stuck with me, one superintendent spoke on, one. One teacher quitting would hurt us in a big way. And I think so many of our schools can relate to that. We have a lot of teachers who are exiting the profession or are thinking about that, and one, has a big effect on our school system. The next uh, data piece is from Washington State, and we can see the number of graduates who are um, leaving education programs, graduating from education programs. And we can see this data was available through 2016, and we can see those numbers drop. We're seeing less individuals entering this profession. And I think it's important to be mindful that educators are very hard to replace. The specialization and requirements inherent to the field make education difficult to extend, extend the talent pool, whereas other fields often have the ability to do so. And this is another Washington data piece. We can see the number of individuals working with emergency certificates in the 2020-21 year. We actually had 53% of educators were working with their emergency certificate that year. And we can see the information on the right-hand side, how many of those individuals with emergency certificates stayed working in the profession that following year. So we can see the numbers decline 2018, 2019, less than half in 2020. So some of that data speaks to the why around this work. Why is this a priority? And really the priorities are endless, but a few more that I'll speak to. Staff well-being really does correlate to the educational equity of our youth. And it has a direct connection to staff retention and mobility. And if we want a school community with adults who have the emotional capacity to build relationships and teach with rigor, then staff wellness is a priority. I have a couple great quotes here for you, but the one that I'll read verbatim for you today is from Dina Simmons. And she says, 
No one really learns well when teachers are stressed and burned out, which is why I say a stressed and burned out teaching force is an equity issue. If we believe in equity and we want our students to do well, we have to ensure educators are doing well too. So this is a big reason around the priority of educator and staff wellness. And again, I know in the work that I am honored to be doing uh, with a focus on mental health for our youth, we talk a great deal around mental health justice being a crucial and pinnacle piece of justice across all other platforms in our school spaces and society as a whole. Without that, we really don't have justice across those other platforms, whether it be educational justice, nutritional justice, et cetera. We really need that in place. And the same thing is true for our educators. Our educator mental health and well being is a pinnacle within our school systems. If we want educators to be able to respond to culturally responsive practices, we know that most of our educators need to be mostly well to do that. If we want them to be teaching with rigor and building relationships on a daily basis, we can have supports in place, smaller class sizes, supports within the classroom, adequate supplies, et cetera. All of that leads back to their well being and mental health. And their well being and mental health allows for those relationships to be built and that exceptional teaching. And if we want them present in the classroom, without the necessity to take on a second and third job and becoming additionally burnt out. We can think about competitive salaries. We can think about the implementation of acknowledging and supporting around secondary trauma. Again, all of that leads back to educator mental health and well-being. And educator mental health and well-being is a pinnacle and a crucial piece within our school systems if we want all of these other equitable practices to be able to take place. I'm just about to introduce you to Dwayne Reed, who I'm so excited uh, is going to be able to speak to you today. I'm just going to, I pulled out this quote recently, and I, I thought even this short two sentences here spoke really well to the conversation we're having today. He said, as a school administrator, I'd much rather have you out for two or three days than learn, lose you to burnout. We need you, but we'll make it work while you're away. Please take your personal days. So what we're talking about today is educator and staff wellness through the lens of self-care, communal care, and systems level care. And this alone acknowledges all of those things. Educators would need to practice self-care to know when they need a day off. They would need communal care to know that peers or colleagues could come into their classroom and support that space without guilt or shame. They would also need systems level care to be able to have subs available to them when needed and supports to help write those sub plans in uh, especially last minute situations. So even this quote alone spoke to what we're talking about today. And again, we're speaking about educator and staff wellness through the lens of self care, communal care and group care. With that, I'm really honored to be able to present to you Dwayne Reed, who's our keynote speaker today. Awesome. Thank you so very much. Can y'all hear me out there? Looking like a yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I'm happy to be here. Honored to be here. Let me start this off right, though. Hello, I'm your teacher. My name is Mr. Reed, and it's very nice to meet you. I'm from Chicago. I love eating pizza and I dress to impress, but I still rock sneakers. It's my fifth year teaching, so it's all real exciting. Got some ideas and I really like to try them. Like making songs to remember what you hear. You'll be learning so much by the end of the year to my friends, my peers, the parents and the students. I'm ready, you're ready, we're ready, let's do this. Yeah, but absolutely no daydreaming. Working hard till the bell starts ringing. Welcome to the fourth grade. Hey, so happy to meet you. Hey, can't wait till I see you. Hey, we're gonna have a good time. Welcome to the fourth grade. And the crowd, even in Washington State, goes wild. What's up, everybody? My name is Dwayne Reed. I am a dean of students currently, um, but formerly a fourth and fifth grade ELA, um, English Language Arts and Social Sciences teacher. Um, I'm here in Chicago on the west side, which is the best side. Um, uh, I used to teach alongside my beautiful wife, who also taught fourth and fifth grade, and now I am a dean of students to a K-8, pre-K to eight school, which means I get the, the honor and the privilege and the blessing to be in the lives of these beautiful, beautiful Black kids here in Chicago. Um, but before I get things 
you know, to, to start it, I want you guys to check out this video. Let's take a look at it. Welcome to the fourth grade So happy to meet you Can't wait till I see you Gonna have a good time We'll learn about science Find ways to apply it And I bet that you'll like it We're gonna have a good time Welcome to the fourth grade Hello, I'm your teacher. My name's Mr. Reed, and it's very nice to meet ya. I'm from Chicago. I love eating pizza, and I dress to impress, but I still rock sneakers. It's my first year teaching, so it's all real exciting. Got some ideas, and I really like to try them. Like making songs to remember what you hear. We'll be learning so much by the end of the year. To my friends and my peers, the parents and the students, I'm ready, you're ready, we're ready. Let's do this. Yeah. But absolutely. Absolutely no daydreaming, working hard till the bell starts ringing. Welcome to the fourth grade. So happy to meet you. Can't wait till I see you. We're gonna have a good time. We'll study mathematics, division and adding. And don't forget fractions. We're gonna have a good time. Welcome to the I'll always greet you with a smile I'll always try to make the lessons worthwhile <laughs> And when you do good work, I'll acknowledge Cause I know that you're headed off to work or to college So we gotta keep it positive, that's the key Have respect for each other and don't forget me Have respect for yourselves and the staff and the school Having fun can be cool when we're following the rules Nah, nah Time's gonna fly Before you know it, you'll be moving into grade five But for now, we'll be working and learning and singing All the way till the bell starts ringing Welcome to the fourth grade So happy to meet you Can't wait till I see you We're gonna have a good time We'll learn about English Write papers and read them A pluses, you'll see them Welcome to the fourth grade. Go, teacher. 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 Yay, yay, yay. I hope you all enjoyed that music video. Okay, remix. Okay, throw it back. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed that music video. It's one of my first ever went viral back in 2016. And that's who I am. That's what I'm about. Um, about fun, about energy, um, about good music, and really showing my kids that, man, I love them and that they're loved. So with that, let's get into this. Um, I know, woosah, right? Um, we all need to take a deep breath as we continue this school year. Um, this ain't like nothing we've ever seen before, not even like last year or the year before. This is different. As we advance even into this school time, we are seemingly met with new challenges every day. How was that supposed to work again? Who was supposed to be running that? When can we mask mandate, vaccinate? There's so much. But again, just breathe. If you're anything like me, you're an educator who can be anxious, stressed, in a constant state of worry because you've got no idea what's coming next. You just want to do your job, do it well, and love your scholars. But the uncertainty of each school day and having your sense of normalcy continually stripped away, that's frustrating. I'll be the one to say it. I hate this. I hate every bit of it. But even if we hate all of this mess, I truly believe we don't have to be a complete mess through it. Yes, many of us are already teacher tired or educator exhausted, but my goal with this session is to do my part to help us wake up a little bit. As we know, it is impossible to fill someone else's cup if our own is empty. I know that from experience. My first year of teaching, 2017, 
Um, I came off the high of going viral, but I couldn't handle the pressure of everything. So I took a non-paid medical leave from my classroom for a month. Um, I thought I could handle everybody's everything, but I couldn't. I had to get away to find out how to take care of me before I could help take care of anybody else. And that's what this little itty bitty session aims to do. Um, let me be transparent. What we need, as Bridget was talking about, is for the system to be scrapped and to be completely rebuilt. I get that. So I won't for a second pretend that the things that I'm about to say are even going to put a dent into the larger issues that we face. But for what it's worth, my aim, at least for today, is to fill up today. What's today? Wednesday, your Wednesday educator cup. You can expect to leave with some a dozen, dozens of simple yet effective self-care practices and ideas, which hopefully can distress your mind, remove some of your anxieties about this school year and restore your soul's inner peace. Because ain't that something we all could get a little bit more of? Peace. The National Institute of Mental Illness breaks down self-care and self-care and wellness into six elements: professional physical, psychological, emotional, social, and spiritual. Today, I've broken this session down into those six parts as well. So without further ado, let's jump straight into it. And side note, if y'all hear my kids being kids, pay them no mind. I love that they're kids and sometimes they get a little noisy, but that's okay. Self-care and personal welfare are important for those in the education profession because teaching, counseling, administrative work, and everything else in between, that can be such an overwhelming job. In order to be professionally sound, educators must care for themselves in ways specific to their profession. Since our job is to take care of scholars or our staff and their needs, we need to focus on what it takes to take care of ourselves first. This idea extends itself into what I consider professional wellness. First, as I saw someone mention earlier, educators must set boundaries. If you're not clear on where you stand or on how much space you need to have between you and the next person, you'll suffocate. I mean, space in a professional sense, but sometimes that includes in a physical sense too. I will tell my kids, especially the little, little, little ones, I need y'all to little back up a little bit. Give me a little space. Give me some room to think. Setting professional boundaries as an educator means making it clear to your staff, your scholars, and to yourselves what amount of time everyone can expect from you and also how much communication you'll be giving them and when. For example, you can set up office hours and say, it is during these times that I'll respond to your questions offline, or I will respond to my work email during these hours only. Or if you're teaching in person like me, it could be letting your kids know, hey, I haven't had a minute to myself all day. My lunchtime today is me time, or my prep time today is me time. I need to recharge for a little bit. Can you let me breathe? Telling someone to give you space is not selfish, it's self-care. If you don't properly set boundaries in place, people will constantly overstep and then often unintentionally overstress you. It can appear simple, but it simply needs to be done. Get your boundaries set up. Next, it's important to talk about your personal life a little bit at work. If you remind your kids or your staff that you're actually a human being, they'll respond by treating you like one. One day, I was experiencing a piercing headache all morning, even after lunch. I made sure to tell my fifth graders in the afternoon that I just wasn't feeling it today in hopes that they would cut Mr. Reed, good old Mr. Reed, a little bit of slack. Well, they heard me loud and clear and were conscious to tone it down a little bit that day. Even when a few of them got a little rowdy, others in the class were quick to check their peers in respect for me and my condition. I found that kids can be really empathetic if we give them the opportunity to empathize. 
Other personal things that you can talk about at work might be your family, your kids at home, your hobbies. Look, I know some of y'all got dogs and cats. Talk about your pet family. Again, the more human that you are to people, the more likely they are to treat you like a human. You won't be seen as a robot. Y'all like that? That's special for y'all. You won't be seen as a robot who has no feelings or who can be demanded of nonstop. Relationships matter in education. Which brings me to my next point. Professional wellness will only happen when you do the hard work of leaving work at work. I catch a lot of flack for this one, but hear me out. As a teacher, I know firsthand just how difficult it is to turn everything off once you've left that classroom. I was there six in the morning to six at night and then taking it to the crib with me. You can't help but think about this scholar, those grades, this one's home life situation, that IEP meeting you've got coming up those unit plans that you haven't finished yet, how the heck to make your back to class transition from lunch and recess a whole lot smoother. All that's going on in your mind. I know it is. Work can always be on your mind, but sometimes that can be a problem. The best way to do well and to be well at your job is to take a break from your job and your mind. At night, try to turn it off. Over the weekend, try to turn it off. Yes, Feel free to research, write down cool ideas you come across, watch some cool TikToks of some educators that inspire you, or loosely map out what's next on the job. But to do work while you're not at work simply doesn't work, at least for keeping yourself professionally well. Again, I know this is a systems issue and a communal issue, yet still it has to be addressed. Got to leave that work at work. It'll get done when it gets done. My next tip on how to practice professional self-care as an educator is this, be able to say no. Nothing will drain you more than having to do everything, which is why it's totally fine to say no to some things. Somebody just told me this last week. They said, I can do anything, but I can't do everything. And I really took that to heart because it's true. If no one else has, I wanted to be the one to give you permission, okay? No, you can say no. In my culture, um, you know, Black culture, we like to have, say this phrase called protect your peace, protect my peace. If any work or tasks that you don't have to do are threatening your sanity or your peace, don't do them. Protect your peace. Don't say yes just because somebody asks you to, because the reality is someone is always going to be asking you to do something. Amen. Amen. Can you run this chess club? Can you run this book club? Can you run this club sandwich over to the other building? Can you help me in building this club about sandwiches? Can you sandwich a meeting in between something else you got going on? Are you going on that field trip? Hey, Mr. Trip, can you stay after? Can you come in earlier? And so on and so forth. Y'all can tell I'm an artist. Y'all can tell I'll be writing rhymes. <laughs> Professional self-care means sometimes saying no and not worrying about just <clears throat> and not worrying yourself about how protecting your peace will impact others. Let me say that again and give me a second. <clears throat> Excuse me. Professional self-care means sometimes saying no and not worrying yourself about how protecting your, your peace will impact others. They'll be okay. They'll find somebody else. The whole thing won't come crashing down just because you chose not to be a part of it this once. There's a a certain humility about saying no and recognizing that you aren't the only solution to everyone else's problems or needs. Educators, we can't say yes to everything this week or this year, shoot, or today. If we want to make it to see our best selves tomorrow, we need to say no to some things today. And finally, as we talk about wellness on the job, we got to talk about proper nutrition. Going into work on an empty stomach each day, it just ain't going to get it done. It just ain't. Sure, like me, you might say, Mr. Reed, breakfast ain't really my thing. My mama say that to me all the time. I don't eat breakfast. But what if you tried to make it your thing? I want to lovingly, respectfully say to my mama, what if you tried to make it your thing, mom? What if you gathered that extra burst of energy through some fresh fruit or smoothie or a handful of cashews or walnuts? And we can't keep skipping lunch, too. And I say that to myself as an administrator. There's so much work that always needs to get done. So I can't scoot out to pick something up. 
This is why packing something healthy and nutritious the night before will be huge. Or asking your significant other to do that. Hey, 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 wife, love you. Thank you so much for loving me in that way. We need that energy from the foods we eat and the water that we drink. Proper professional wellness means eating good on the job too. Next, as we transition into the second element of wellness, which is physical wellness, I want us to, I wanted to remind us of what self-care really is. Self-care, when done right, is inherently after the well-being of others. It's not selfish. Teachers are the first ones to want to help everybody and their mama, yet the last ones to think about helping ourselves. And I'm not okay with that. So I'm here to dispel, dispel that notion. It is in our scholars' best interest to do everything possible to ensure that our energy is where it needs to be. Us being on top of our game and ready to take on challenges creates an environment where our kids will feel the urgency to be on top of their game, too. I can't tell you the number of times I had a scholar mention how excited they were to do an assignment or to engage in a lesson simply because I led with that kind of energy, because I had that kind of energy to give. So it makes sense that we discuss physical wellness as we bring up ways to be and to keep energized. Let's walk through it. The first thing that comes to mind, and I'm going to keep it 100 with y'all. The first thing that comes to mind is sleep. One of the most important ways to get that energy back physically is to rest. But I'll admit it. I struggle with this. Me. that Raise your hand if you struggle with getting some sleep. We just talking about sleep right now. Five years ago, I was in college. So trying to break away from that Netflix binging, social media scrolling, WebMD. Oh, my gosh. Do I have that? Trying to break away from those kinds of nights, that's a challenge for me. I can't sit here and tell y'all that I haven't gone into school on four hours of sleep because I have. And I bet many of you all have too. For a lot of us, we might not be staying up to watch reruns of The Office like me, but instead we're staying up for research, to perfect our lessons, to tinker with online resources, or learn how to make our classroom or our office space better. Whatever the reason is, not getting enough sleep is not doing you any justice. Your body needs those hours to rest or recharge, to recalibrate, and to even re-inspire you for the next day. Three Christmases ago, as my students make their transition back from lunch recess, um, three Christmases ago, I took my wife, who was also a teacher, on a surprise trip to Jamaica. I know, husband of the year, all praise Mr. Reed. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But on our trip, she kept saying this to me, how relaxing it was to get away, to take her mind off of work, school, and the challenges that we had waiting for us back at home. After a few days of sunshine, jerk chicken, and Bob Marley, she told me how inspired and ready she felt to get back to the second semester of school. What got her going? Her time of rest. Educators, we must rest so that we can recharge and get our energy back to where it needs to be. Not just resting every Christmas or every summer or even over the weekend, but every night we got to rest. Create a solid sleep schedule and stick to it. While your bedroom might not be Jamaica, snuggling up under those sheets and pillows is your way to make sure that every little thing is going to be all right. Make sure to get some sleep so that you can be energized for your kids and your colleagues tomorrow. And oh, yeah, don't forget to take those little cat naps that you can sneak in throughout your day. I took one yesterday and it was whew, it was a blessing from God. Next, as we discuss educated self-care in regard to physical wellness, we have to talk about food again. And you know what? I'm not mad about it. As you know, we got to eat to live. But I want to take it a step further and suggest we have to eat right to live right. I can be the biggest junk food, candy, sweets connoisseur in the world. But eating like that is not going to keep me energized. In fact, it's going to do the complete opposite and drain me of my energy. The renowned poet, um, Aubrey Graham, a.k.a. Drake, once said, got a lot of enemies trying to drain me of my energy. And that's what that junk food will do to you, drain you of your energy, which is why I believe that physical self-care will involve us being mindful of that which we put into our bodies. Now, I'm not here to command y'all to go vegan, to convince you to become pescatarian, or to even convert you into an Episcopalian. 
that was a joke. I wish I could hear y'all because I guarantee that joke was going to land. But anyways, but what I do feel obligated to do is to encourage you to eat stuff that's been scientifically proven to fill you up, keep you healthy and get you energized. An apple in the morning instead of that donut, some vegetables instead of that third slice of pizza. I'm talking to myself. Water instead of that big old cup of Diet Coke. They say you are what you eat. I don't want somebody to look at me and call me a ho-ho. <laughs> I don't want nobody to look at me and call me a, a hostess Twinkie. I want you to see me as some rich, deep, vegan mac and cheese. And finally, as we discuss self-care, we got to talk about exercise. Your body is the only one you've got, which makes it that much more important to care for it. All day long, educators are exercising their minds. So what about adding a little exercise onto the body too? But I can hear right now, I can hear y'all in my emails and my DMs saying, Mr. Reed, I'll be walking around all day chasing around these kids. And now you want me when I go home to run around like a dog all night? No, sir. I'm not saying you have to be Gabby Douglas or LeBron James or Usain Bolt, but I am encouraging you to move. Go for a walk around your neighborhood. Take the stairs instead of the elevator. Park a little further away from the entrance of the store. And for those of us who are working virtually, we especially need to stay active after sitting in front of a screen for so long and sitting on our butts for so long. Get up and do some jumping jacks, some push-ups. Uh, these things literally get your blood flowing more, which activates your brain a little bit more. Now, so far, we've discussed educated self-care and personal welfare from two lenses, professional wellness, and physical wellness. Now we'll transition into the third piece of this puzzle, which is psychological wellness or your mental health. My first year teaching, as I mentioned, I was forced to learn the hard way, just how important it is to take care of your mind and your mental state. I had all this pressure that I placed on myself as I wanted to be the best first year teacher of all time. I, I, I swore to my college classmates that I was going to get the presidential honor of teacher of the year, national teacher of the year. That's that was my mindset. I was getting into work at six, not leaving till 630 at night, reading every blog and book I could get my hands on, trying to be the best teacher I could be. I was singing songs, playing games at recess, putting together big time lessons, planning all kind of field trips. I even gave one of the parents of one of my scholars my car. I did as a Mother's Day gift to her. To say I was dedicated to teaching in my community would have been an understatement. I was all in. But pretty soon, being all in like that, that stress caught up to me. I gotten so swamped with work that I became depressed and it felt like I wasn't doing enough. And then all of my flaws became magnified in my mind and daily, even though I had experienced some successes, I felt like a failure. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? It don't got to be first year you, fifth year you, 20th year you. It could be 25th year you. Am I preaching to anybody but myself? So halfway through the year, I decided to take a month long leave of absence. I needed a reset. I needed a hard reset. I'm not necessarily encouraging you to do something like that if you don't need that. But I am encouraging you to do whatever it takes in order for you to come back stronger the next day or the next week or the next month for your kids and for your staff. So how can we keep our mental affairs in order? My number one tip, like take a self-care day, just as Bridget mentioned, I wrote about or three. Take off from work so that you can be better off when you return to work. Another one of the best ways I found to de-stress and regulate my mental space is to practice self-reflection. Take 10 minutes after you've sent your staff or your scholars home after that work meeting or after everyone is signed off to go over your day. Here's some questions that I typically write through if you want to write these down. Um, how was today? Simple as that. What did I like about the day? What moments made me feel negatively and why? Is there any way I can prevent that from happening again? Who might I need to apologize to? Was I my best self in every encounter I had with somebody today? And lastly, for me, was I the educator today that I would have wanted as a kid? As you spend time reflecting over some of the answers to these questions, it'll force your mind to work through some of what you might need to work on. 
And by processing your thoughts today, it'll help you break down a lot of the stress that might be building itself into a stress monster that will seek to attack you tomorrow. This is why self-reflection is huge. Another thing that this lends itself to is keeping something like a thankful journal. Every morning on my, my, my way to work, when I sit 45 minutes in traffic and I got nothing but anger and complaints and road rage, I say, what three things am I thankful for? And that breaks up that funk. How can you practice gratitude? As Bridget also alluded to, she said, hope is a discipline. Gratitude is also a discipline. I have to put in the work. So journaling. And finally, what, as we look at what it looks like to, for teachers to practice self-care in regard to our psychological needs, we should consider exploring our creativity. Yes, we teach all day, but what, it, what would it look like if we became the learners? Teachers can practice mental wellness by taking on a new hobby or enrolling in a master class on a topic that interests them. What's something that you always wanted to do but have never had the time to do? Maybe sewing, how to do eyelashes, makeup, a better way to throw a football, how to cook delicious meals. Maybe you want to know how to make the perfect paper airplane. That's me. It's a big hit with all the fourth graders. What's something you can use your time away from work to focus on and to focus your brain on while you're away from work? Watch your stress levels start to decrease as you put your energy into something that really gets you going. Now, as we near the end of this session, I like to remind us all how important teacher self-care and personal welfare is. It's what's best for your scholars when you are professionally well, physically sound, and mentally in a good place. And of course, your emotions need to be in check too, which brings us to the fourth element of our talk, emotional wellness. This is, this is where it really, 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 really gets good for me. I'm a super emotional person. Teachers have the right to feel how we need to feel. Educators have the right to feel how you need to feel. If it's feeling angry about an injustice, we should feel angry. If it's feeling disgusted by racism and inequities, we should feel disgusted. If it's feeling nervous about where education's headed, we have the right to feel nervous. Ain't no shame, ain't no guilt. And one of the biggest tips I can give you on how to healthily regulate your emotions is to feel your feelings. Don't pass them off. Sure, don't stay stuck in an emotion, but do allow yourself the opportunity to completely work through it. You see what I'm saying? Work your way through what you're feeling. And if it's a negative emotion, especially work your way out of it. If it's joy, you feel joy, try to, try to stay there as long as you can, okay? When was checkout again? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna stay extra day. But <laughs> one year, talking about feeling your feelings, one year, one of my favorite students in the world uh, stole something from me. At first I was mad at her, but then I became mad at myself for becoming mad at her. That's not right, nor was it helpful to me or to her. If nothing else, it was right for me to be mad at her, then to explain why I was mad so that she could understand how she negatively impacted me. My feelings and working through my emotions, me expressing my feelings and working through my emotions could have helped her grow. I should have allowed myself the experience Excuse me, I should have allowed myself to experience an appropriately responsive emotion to her action. I deserved to have that feeling, but just not to stay there. So the next day, I pulled myself up and I said, look, we're going to address this. I addressed it. We squashed our beef and then we kept it pushing. That scholar never stole anything from me again. And to this day, she just texted me yesterday, actually. She's in high school. I trust that scholar with my life. I trust her with my baby's life. I say, when you coming over to babysit, girl. But that only happened because I allowed myself to feel my feelings. Teachers, it's okay to feel your feelings. So much good can come out of it. It's emotional wellness. Another way to keep your emotional well-being intact is to breathe. You know, breathing techniques have been proven to alleviate stress and reduce anxiety. And with everything that's going on, we need every little bit of help that we can get. So breathe. Take a deep breath in through the nose. 
let it out through the mouth or vice versa, however you get down. You can also, as I'm kind of rushing through these things at the end here, you can also do things like listen to your favorite music. A good upbeat song can set your tone for the whole day or reset your mood for the rest of the afternoon. Anybody in here listen to 90s uh, hip hop or 90s R&B, blast it real loud in the morning to get you going? I know y'all do. I know y'all get y'all Starbucks coffee or your little tea and you be, yeah, jamming to that Tupac in the morning. It's okay. No shame. No shame there. And finally, as we talk about our emotional health, we need to identify moments where we practice negative self-talk and work against them. How many times have you talked yourself out of something good before even giving it a shot? How many times have you looked at yourself and said, I don't exactly feel the best about this, so never mind. Before I gave this talk, this very one I'm giving right now, I thought, I'm just an educator, bro. I'm not licensed in nothing. I'm not qualified about none of this. I'm just a teacher, I said to myself. Who's going to care what I have to say? This is just going to fail. This is just going to flail. No one's going to pick up on this. But negative self-talk can be a mood and a dream killer and can have your emotions all over the place. Something I like to practice instead is known as realistic optimism. Realistically, statistically even speaking, you're going to make it through this school year. And if you add optimism to that, your scholars are going to grow in ways you never could have imagined. Not, ah, this year is a wash. We can't do this. I feel so bad for everyone. But now, no, no, no. This school is going to be amazing in its own way. We can do this. There is good that can come from this. I just got to look for it. I just got to mine it. I just got to build it up. Don't let you tell you what to do and how to feel. You tell you what to do. It's, com it's confusing, but how about this? Get rid of the negative self-talk and speak confidently to yourself with realistic optimism. Take care of yourself emotionally, y'all. Teachers, self-care is so important. It's not selfish to make sure that you're personally doing okay, nor is it selfish to be selective in how you engage with others. The fifth aspect of personal welfare that we're briefly going to discuss as I'm running near on time is social wellness. As you protect your time, your peace, your space, that means deciding who gets access to those things, when and for how long. Spend time with the people who fill you up when you're feeling empty or mellow you out if things are getting too hectic for you. <clears throat> Come home and talk to your significant other or your kids or maybe just exist in their presence. Talk to your cat. Look, if you talk to your cat and you're one of those people, I cannot judge you. I can't judge you. For those 20, 30 minutes that you're on the car ride home, listen to some music or podcast or just enjoy Driving in silence, if that's peaceful for you, let it be. Another self-care tip when it comes to your social wellness can be summed up in th these three words, mute, unfollow, block. I wish I could have like everybody unmute themselves and just say it with me, mute, unfollow, block. Anyone on social media who gets you off your square for any reason, you gotta let them go. If they're a trigger for you in any negative ways, remove that trigger or remove the opportunity for that person to trigger you. I'm not calling for what's known as, or some have called as to be cancel culture. I'm not calling for that. What I think we need to do is be able to engage with others whom we disagree with or to show them grace if we feel they've made a mistake. But if somebody's constantly giving you grief, it's okay to give them the digital boot or the digital mute from your life and watch your anxiety levels go down. And lastly, you got to shut the screens off. Just shut the screens off, y'all. Um, are we feeling a little more cared for? Almost getting there? Hopefully this last piece will help get you where you need to be just today. The final aspect that we're going to talk about in regards to wellness is your spiritual wellness. Now, you don't have to be a follower of Jesus or of Buddha or of anybody else to be spiritual but if that's how you get down, to get down with your bad self. I personally got to stay prayed up or else the world is going to swallow me up. I pray for my kids, my principal, my coworkers, and myself so that I don't do or say anything to my kids, my principal, my coworkers that I might regret later on. 
So if you need to get your spirit in tune with your body, I recommend prayer. There's also meditation and mindfulness. Some people find their peace by simply being at peace, being silent, thinking. After lunch and recess, I sometimes ask my scholars to join me in mindfulness and breathing exercises. This so that we can all calm down and prepare ourselves for the afternoon. Last but not least, go be one with nature. I'm not going to go camping. I'm not going to be out there with the bugs and the bees and the dirt and the Mm -mm, that's not going to be me. But look, if that's your thing, by all means, go for it. Whatever you need to do to keep that spiritual aspect of yourself where it needs to be, do that. And with that, educators, amazing people, we have reached the end of this session. I pray my words have been an encouragement to you as you continue this school year and the next. And I hope that today I've helped you believe a little bit more how important self-care is, especially during times like these. In a perfect world, you will find ways to practice wellness that address each aspect daily, professional, physical, psychological, emotional, social, and spiritual. Hopefully you slow down, you take a breath and you fill up your own educator cup. You need to, I'm telling as a parent, as a proud parent now, I'm telling you, you got to fill up your cup. And more importantly, your scholars and your staff need for you to protect y'all's peace, beloved. My name is Mr. Reed. You can follow me at Teach Mr. Reed online. Thank you so much for rocking with me. Peace. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Reed. Oh, it makes me feel so much better just to think about all of these lovely strategies just to recenter and um to bring back some of the life <laughs> that we all have just waiting to energize the room um it looks like um we have some time for a little bit of a poll and it, our presenters were wondering about um what are you doing for self-care that's working how would you want your school to encourage self-care in a systemic way and what are the concrete actions that you'd want to see? So um, we're curious for your thoughts and we're hoping we can take just a minute to look into the chat and, and get some feedback from y'all. It looks like. And in. And I'm seeing lots of love in the chat, Mr. Reed. excellent presentation today. And let's see. Um, and Donna put out the SEBB and PEBB Smart Health has a lot of resources. So, ooh, some thoughts. We're going to allow for some bathroom breaks and some lunch breaks. What about yoga and meditation, some breath work as part of the curriculum with students? Um, I've seen that um, in different classrooms with excellent effects. It's just bringing it back to your breath. Uh, meditate in, in the car, that's a great idea. Instigate some self-care, leave. Yeah. Gardening, roller skating, quiet time, focus on um, the science of hope, yay, the science of hope. Running, walking, leave work on time, disc golf. I love these suggestions, y'all. Um, we are gonna transition to our next um, portion of the show, but I do want y'all to be looking at this chat and use it as a resource. Because I think we have solutions um, we have great ideas out here in the audience as well. Um, so next up, we're gonna be going to our practitioner panel. And um, in our panel, what we're striving to do is to present you with some live action examples from Washington State. So uh, we have with us um, Mikey and Associates and Michelle and Megan, would you like to introduce yourselves? Ah, yes. Thanks, Kepi. Good morning. Um, before I get started, 
Uh, I want to acknowledge that we at Mike and Associates live and work on the traditional lands of the first people of this area, the Ho, Quileute, Macaw, Jamestown Sklallam, and Lower Elwha Sklallam, whose elders past and present we honor and offer our gratitude. Hi everyone. Oh my gosh, that's a, that's a hard one to follow. <laughs> Uh, no walk-in music here, but I'll do my best. I'm Michelle Mikey. I'm the owner and director of Mikey & Associates. We are a certified small, micro actually, since there's only two of us, woman-owned evaluation and research consulting firm located in Port Angeles, Washington, on the beautiful Olympic Peninsula where the mountains greet the sea. As a research consultant, I've spent most of my career working within the education, juvenile justice, and criminal justice systems. My work has included the evaluation of gun violence reduction initiatives, adolescent substance abuse prevention and treatment projects, juvenile delinquency prevention projects, and most recently, several school-based mental health services projects, such as Project AWARE, that incorporate a multi-tiered system to support framework. Thank you for being with us today, and I'd like you uh, to meet Megan. Great, thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, my name is Megan Osborne, Research Associate at Mike and Associates. Um, and I joined Michelle in 2014, actually as part of the first um, Project AWARE grant for Washington State. And since then I've stayed engaged um, in the school-based work, mostly integrating behavioral health services into public education, definitely um, focusing on that multi-tiered system of supports um, framework for mental health. We're currently evaluating um, Washington's second Project AWARE with Bridget um, and three wonderful LEAs located in the Yakima Valley. And we're also providing evaluation um, of Kaiser Permanente's um, tier two and tier three supports grants with Highline Public Schools. We'll have Sophie next and also ESD 189 um, in partnership with Mount Vernon and Cedra Woolley. And both of these projects um, have an eye towards focusing on the kind of systemic side of adult wellness, which is why we're here today to talk to you. So I am just grateful to be here and um, I'm gonna hand it over to Sophie. Thanks, Megan and Michelle. Good morning. Um, in the Highline School District, we are on the ancestral land stewarded since time immemorial by the Salish people of the Duwamish, Green, White, Cedar, and Puyallup, Upper Puyallup Rivers, many of these giving birth to the contemporary citizens of the Muckleshoot Indian tribe. Uh, my name is Sophie DeHaan. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a licensed mental health therapist and a mental health professional. Um, my current role in Highline is as a behavioral health systems navigator, uh, trying to bridge these two systems of education and mental health, uh, identify and mitigate barriers as much as possible and supporting adult wellness and access to mental health services. I also work in the emergency department at Children's Hospital as a mental health evaluator, um, originally from Louisiana, but now attempting to thrive <laughs> in the PNW. Uh, it's significantly colder today than I have ever known a March to be. Um, I think that's everything about me. I will hand it back over to Kathy. Thanks all. Um, so we have we have questions for you, <laughs> Bridget and I, and um, we're wondering, um, Bridget, I think you've got this first one. Absolutely. Yeah. Again, thanks so much to our panelists for being here. I'm going to bring it back to the beginning of my presentation, the quote from Dina Simmons. No one really learns well when teachers are stressed and burn out, which is why I say a stress and burnout teaching force is an equity issue. If we believe in equity and we want our students to do well, we have to ensure our educators are doing well. So I'd love to hear thoughts on in, in what ways is educator well-being an equity issue? Absolutely. Thanks, Bridget. Um, I do start answering this question by thinking through my own lens as a mental health professional, as a mental health counselor, and in an emergency department right now where everything is so overwhelmed, both the healthcare system and the mental health care system, which are sometimes separate. But um, I do find that I'm unfortunately surrounded by inequitable access to support services and programs that's often just playing out in real time. And as I'm sure many of you know, as educators and in education, not everyone has access to what they need. 
uh, including from like be in an adult or educator perspective, even if you're not an educator, just as an adult, you know, people think, oh, I'm an adult. I have easy. It's easier. It's fine. That's not at all true in any way. I think uh, that's become more and more obvious, especially over the last two years. Um, well-being is an equity issue because if staff don't feel able to feel and be their full selves, their healthy selves, their get a break to separate from their work selves, then we're truly asking for folks to put every single other person ahead of them. And whose dream includes running yourself into the ground to make sure everyone else around you can survive or can thrive while you yourself are barely surviving. That's not that's not anybody's wish for the world or, or hope for themselves. Um, without meeting individual educator needs, a far greater task than meeting collective needs because you actually have to figure out, hey, what's everybody's individual goal or individual, like, how can we, right? That's what equity is, is finding exactly what each individual thing, you know, or meeting everybody at what their individual need is, even if it's not what collectively everybody needs simultaneously. Um, that you find that teachers are unheard and tired and expected to act like superheroes and treated like they don't matter. And they might get a banner that says you're a superhero, but they don't actually feel it right there. Um, they, they, uh, they leave the field earlier and earlier and like uh, rightfully so, and they shouldn't be blamed for it because who wants to go to work every day, even though you love the kids, right? That's the thing that's every, oh, you love the kids, do it for the kids, do it for the kids. But like, if you don't have anything left to give, then it, it's not it's not totally irrelevant, but it's so hard and it becomes so hard to get to work every day and to, to put forth and, right, you can't fill from an empty cup. Um, and so not caring for that adult well-being leads to losing adults and educators who are embedded in our system, the way our system was created as caregivers and role models and mind molders and trauma specialists and team players and teachers have to just and educators and, and everybody in the in the system has to wear all of these hats. You have to not leave anybody behind and also go with the flow and also meet everybody where they're at. Um, and, and you just have to show up that way continuously, but you never get to feel as Dwayne and Bridget previously mentioned earlier, that you're able to disconnect from those things. And you also are like, well, I don't have any time to take any time off. So how do I do this? Right. So that's all of that encapsulated is uh, such a big equity issue, um, to, to needing to, to meet adult wellness. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much guilt around taking time off, but if our system doesn't account for people taking time off, it's not sustainable. So we've got to rethink it a little bit. And I mean, I'm seeing um, with Mikey and Associates, I know that Highline has done some work to think about what is a larger context for how can we create a community care um, approach to this. And so I was wondering um, how do you think that we could incorporate these adults into the SEL protocols, the MTSS frameworks to honor that adult mental health and well-being? And Michelle and uh, Megan, do you have some thoughts about what it might look like at that level? Well, uh, let's go back to that PowerPoint and we'll, we'll open up a, a little slide that yeah. gives us the frame of reference. Shocking, right? You probably have never seen this slide or anything like this. Um, so this is, we, when we think about kids, we think about them addressing them through that tiered level approach, both from the academic side and from the social emotional side. Uh, but what we found in the work that we've been doing uh, in, in our different sites, especially as we were looking at adult wellness, is that there really was no framework. There was no one that was actually addressing the well being needs of adults through that continuum of supports. Uh, and, but, and yet we know that adults too come with different levels of risk or, or um, needs. And it was, you know, at that moment, Meg and I sitting at the table with our partners, there was this, this light bulb moment that came on that said, we really need to put together a framework that provides that same level of support in looking at adult well-being through this more systemic um, approach. That uh, prompted us, we wrote a brief, it's called the Multi-Tiered Systems of Support for Adults Addressing Behavioral Health Needs of Staff in the School System. It's just a short brief. We released that um, from funding support with Kaiser Permanente of Washington. 
it is available on our website uh, and it's also available as a resource here today. But that really is a, like a starting place for how to address um, adult social emotional learning within the as a systems approach. Yep, we can always tier our support. It is a helpful model out there. And I just, I do want to just, um, I really want to push for one super important component. When you look at this um, triangle and you look at the bottom, right? It's that those foundational policies and practices. So when we think about ensuring um, that this approach is going to be sustainable, so that it's that those policies and practices are super critical. They form the base of that triangle, those district-wide policies and practices that, that promote uh, and support staff well-being, set that expectation at the district level um, that healthy behaviors are, we're committed to that. We're committed to healthy behaviors. We're committed to staff well-being. And the systems level approach really sets up adult wellness as a sustainable component to the education system. And it's not seen as just another flavor of the day. And, and Michelle, oh, go ahead. go ahead, Bridget, sorry. <laughs> I was just gonna add Michelle to your, to your point about you know, the systems level piece, you know, taking what we heard from Dwayne that was really focusing on, you know, what can we do as individuals, as educators in the school system, you know, there's, there's a lot that individuals can do, um, but we believe that the system, you know, is becoming, needs to become more accountable and responsible to this piece, that the adults need to be part of this system. As we know, we would not have public education if we didn't have adults <laughs> who are willing to teach and be administrators and paras and serve lunches and drive school buses. And so really, um, I think kind of changing the, the framework of, prioritizing the adults just as we do for the students. Um, and that really does come through these policies and practices come at that systems level piece that Michelle was speaking to. And that really resonates with me, especially those strong tier one supports. What do all educators need to be successful? And, and I feel like Michelle and Megan, you're, you're starting to speak on this, but what specifically can schools do? Leadership, uh, what can we be looking around policy? What, what's kind of actionable items around this work? Yeah, thanks, Bridget. Um, you know, this sounds kind of too simple, but when I was mulling over some of these questions, it's like, you know, what we've observed is when this work is prioritized, capacity is created for it, um, which is really interesting. I mean, think of any kind of initiative. If, if that is just put forth as how we do business now or how we're going to do business as a school system, things... <laughs> things will change and shift and the capacity will increase to do that work. And so, I mean, that's just kind of a mindset piece to it. Um, you know, the framework that Michelle and I put together as, as part of our work with districts really isn't intended to be one more thing. And I was kind of already speaking to this, but um, it's just to kind of put these little piecemeal one off, you know, here's a 15 minute break or pizza day or something into some more concrete, sustainable supports for staff that are more meaningful. Um, and I think if we go to the next slide, Kefi, we do have um, just some kind of big picture steps. Um, we know this work is very slow and difficult, especially with the challenges of COVID and the constant pivot that schools and districts are going through right now. So again, um, this is some just thoughts, considerations of how this work could be implemented. And I think just starting with, with some of the basics, um, you know, having a champion, that is not one single person, but um, having a group of champions, some of which need, must have policy um, and decision-making authority within the system, but creating kind of this group, you know, a team that can work on this work together, you know, that, that comes from all different places within the building or within the school system um, to work and prioritize staff well-being and, and these issues. Um, 
And with that team, I mean, again, this is all sounds familiar for implementing any of these, you know, multi-tiered systems of support. It starts with the same components, you know, leadership, team, that energy that Dwayne had that I hope we can all carry with us for the rest of the day and the week, because that was phenomenal. Um, but utilizing that team and then guess what? Take a look around what systems currently exist, um, doing that kind of systems assessment. Are there supports that just aren't utilized? Um, are there major gaps in the system, which we, of course, know that there are for adults? Um, and I think some of those first two, you know, just that framework, getting this, this committee in place or a team in place, um, hopefully not creating a new one or creating new work, because I know that's always an issue with um, having multiple teams doing different work. But some of that just reorganizing um, and framing of this work and planning, I think, is the first step. Uh, I do not want to go through all five years of this slide because then it's overwhelming and it's too much. Um, so I'll just let that sit there. And um, Michelle, if there's anything you wanted to add to that or Sophie. Well, I, I, I would just reiterate again, going back to um, that district leaders, when they emphasize the importance of um, staff well-being, right, we, then we start to destigmatize mental health. And that's really one of the things that we need to do. And I'm sure Sophie can uh, talk to this much better than I. <laughs> No, oh, that's totally fine, Michelle. I was just going to add that, like, if we are really thinking in a tiered systems of support approach, right, if X or happens or, or someone is showing up in a certain way, we might think, okay, well, what is a tier two support? What are we doing a little bit more of? How are we adding check-ins? Can that look like, okay, so there's the staff support team, like Megan, what you're talking about, but then can we also hold a grief and loss space or secondary trauma space or compassion fatigue space where it's like, you know, people get together monthly or, you know, hey, I'm really struggling right now with my own stuff. Are there other people and knowing that you have, you know, hey, for six weeks, we're going to meet and, and uh, uh, granted, of course, finding time in the day. So acknowledging that that's the huge piece of like, I already have so much to do. Now you want me to take time for myself? Like, that's not how educators think, right? That's not what's not how we've ever been allowed to think because we've never been allowed to fully feel we're able to take space for ourselves. Um, and so then if you need more than that tier two, you would bump up a kiddo to a tier three. So we bump up educators to a tier three. Maybe that's one-on-one -on -one check ins. Maybe that's actually having a trauma informed therapist in a school. Right now I'm talking like big picture wild dreams, I acknowledge, but like, you know, a therapist that the adults can go to, right? And like EAP being beefed up in a way that people feel is actually accessible. Cause I know people are, like, oh, EAP, you know, it sounds great. But then when it's actually being used, right? You may not feel you're getting connected to somebody. Somebody doesn't know your school's culture or your district's culture. Um, and so if we can start getting universal or if people aren't getting that universal support and then are never bumped up to that individual level of support, that's when they're leaving more, right? Being more community-based, teachers getting together for more than just staff meetings, um, learning how people are and how they show up and how they exist so that you know, hey, that person's giving their tell that they're struggling right now. Um, and, and even like shifting how staff meetings occur already. But again, acknowledging like it's got to be a team effort and oftentimes that has to come from the top. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's another part of like, hey, is there an actual policy change that can happen? Is there a, a, sh a cultural shift in the school district or in the state, right? At OSPI, you know, I, anyway, I'm getting, I'm getting, again, big dreams, sorry. Um, but really creating structure without rig, uh, like rigid rigidity um, and allowing staff to use vacation and sick days without guilt, which means having a robust sub system, which means having money, right? And so it's like one thing after another, but can we start with like what Megan and Michelle were mentioning, right? Starting with what is the MTSS? What is what is the first tier that we're doing now? And what already exists that we can we can build upon? And truly like creating space for rest is an actively challenging white supremacy in a super tangible way. So. And I, I think you spoke to so much of this, Sophie. We got a question. Uh, someone would love to just hear more specifics. What would some district-wide social emotional health policies and practices look like? And I think you spoke to so much of that, Sophie. But also when we think about the context of mental health, the umbrella is, is so wide. So a, as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, this can also include you know, competitive pay. So individuals are not taking on second and third jobs. It's that acknowledgement and that support around secondary trauma. It supports in the classroom. It's adequate resource. Says it's creating a school climate that normalizes 
time off and has the systems in place that there is a sub pool to pull from. It's not awarding individuals that they never take a day off and they come in even when they're ill. It, it, it's all of these collective practices that fall under the mental health umbrella um, that are, are built from that systems level that then help have the positive aspects when individuals take on uh, work around self-care. Yeah. Bridget, just to address Annie's question about some more specifics, and I know Sophie spoke to some, what I think is, you know, interesting is that, not interesting, the reality is this work is, this is new and hard. And so the districts we've been working with, um, you know, it's piecemeal. This isn't, this is, this is not like some tried and true, we have it all figured out. This is how you do staff wellness. So I want to acknowledge that. Um, but also some of some of the first steps that districts did take is having a wellness vision mission and vision statement that, that came out that's posted on the district site. Um, so several of our districts have have done that work. The committee went through a process of you know finding the right language, you know getting board approval, going through this whole piece to just kind of name that this is intentional work we're starting to do. And so I know that's not <laughs> probably specific enough, but it is these kind of it's a long process and it is taking you know to that piece of needing district buy-in and leadership is owning that we're going to start trying to do this work. And here's what it's good. Here's what we want it to look like. So I think that's just, again, one of those first steps that can be this tangible piece. But words, words matter. <laughs> well, I, th I think that also an answers the question, because if um, and, and that takes some time to establish vision, mission and values, because behind that is also action items. We're saying this is important. And what are we doing and how are we going to make a plan to communicate this out over time of what we're accomplishing and, and the goals that we're moving forward on and, and different pathways that we need to um, attain when we hear back from our educators and staff about the work. Well, and I think even like the acknowledgement that this is something that administrators care about. I mean, that would make me feel better as a teacher to hear that someone is someone is thinking about my wellness. <laughs> I think that that matters and I, it sends a message um, that that you're cared for and not taken for granted. And I think that some of these systems where we look at you know, not having enough substitute teachers, not having um, the ability to take a day off. I mean, those are capacity problems that, um, and, and then they expect you to work all weekend and after school and six to six. And I think that, I mean, that is, it's unrealistic. <laughs> so people are going to get tired and and I think that too, we're also asking people to participate in professional development and so there's this weird tension between we want you to have wellness and you don't have time for wellness. Um, and I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are around that and um, if there's any advice we can offer to our audience around um, how to balance professional development and their own self-care. Oh, absolutely. Um, so I, I, I it, it reminds me of my husband when he tells me I should do things and I'm like, honey, don't shit on me. And I think there's a whole lot of shouldn't going on in, in the world right now. And, and what we really need to do, the first thing that we need to do is elevate the voices of our school staff to ask them, what do you need to help you down this path? Um, whether it's through surveys or focus groups or anything, the same kinds of things we would do with kids. But it's not just asking, it's actually listening and hearing and putting what we heard into action. If you don't do that, then this will not work because you need to build up that trust in the system. Megan, got anything to say about that? No, I think that's, I mean, that's so powerful, Michelle. And I, I think we fail often in kind of getting, get, closing that full loop on asking for feedback um, and engagement and then kind of falling short in the policy realm. Um, and, and as, as you know, districts develop professional development plans, I mean, really taking that feedback. I mean, how do we 
not make this one more thing, but how do we take things off plates or re and I'm going to go back to this reprioritization piece. Like you can create capacity for these things by making it more important than something else. Now there's a lot of moral conundrums of what those, you know, that's a value thing. What is the most important piece? It's always going to be finding that balance. What that is, is going to look like, look different for every school community and teacher community. Um, but I would say, you know, we have seen districts successfully kind of revamp professional development plans that focus specifically on what staff have asked for. And that just makes that time spent with that professional learning more valuable and, and less stressful where it isn't one more thing. It's like, oh, this is actually going to help me in X, Y, and Z, whatever, you know, the topic is. And um, so I know easier said than done, but I think that reprior reprioritization piece while using staff feedback, and that's all staff feedback, you know, this isn't, this is the whole school system's feedback, um, can really help shape that work and provide support that's relevant and meaningful. And, and I would offer too, so in, in the brief, we provide um, like a, a environmental scan, a, a mapping. What are you, what are you currently doing with in, in your professional development realm that really is no longer relevant to the world that we live in today? So what can we take away and then replenish as needed, right? Instead of always building, 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 because that's the way things have already, you know, we've always done things. Well, the world we live in today is not the same. And so we need to reframe our look at professional development. I just want to quickly add, oh, I'll be quick, Kathy, sorry. Um, okay. Is that like, you know, can, that also looks like allowing people to get caught up on what they're doing and not dictating their time outside of teaching unless they're asking for that level of structure and support. There's so much like, we got to get this in front of you. We got to get this in front of you. We got to get this in front of you. And like, if we don't allow space for everybody to get caught up to even halfway, you know, to where they're trying to get to, then it's just, you're constantly paying catch up. And that's like, there's no adult wellness there. There's no, if you don't have autonomy in who you are at, in your work, then there's not any adult wellness. So really allowing space for that and, and trusting the people that are, are, you know, that you're, you're saying, you know, you're an adult and you have this job and I trusted you enough to hire you. Okay. Well, trust me enough to, to do a little bit of my job and have a little bit more autonomy. Yeah. And autonomy is such a big motivator, right? You have the power in your hands to affect what happens. And I think that's a, a good closing thought for our panel today. Thank you all for contributing. And um, I love um, Dwayne Reed's thought about protecting your peace and prioritizing that. And I hope that everybody is keeping that in mind. I'm gonna, I'm gonna add that to my vocabulary as well. Um, we do want our conversations today to come up uh, beyond this meeting. And so we're hoping that our audience will consider discussing these ideas with leadership, um, maybe with your colleagues or even with a group of students. Um, and just take it into the next week and make it an action <laughs> and not just information. Um, we do have a couple of resources to share. Um, there is funding available through OSPI. We hope you take advantage of that funding. Um, we do have a newsletter uh, that's based on best practices for engagement, the Engage newsletter, and we hope that y'all can subscribe to that. Um, and we have um, a link. So if you ever want to connect with OSPI staff, we can get you in touch with the right person. And uh, Bridget, do you want to talk a little bit about resources? Yeah, I'll just take one moment. So in the chat we shared a variety of resources with you from articles talking about this discussion, some great surveys. I particularly really like the workload toolkit. It was spoken about throughout this presentation, but just now in our panel talking about uh, a deep reflection on, on educator workload um, and also the school wellness committee toolkit. You also have a variety of reflection questions, whatever resources you interact with individually or with a team, you can also reflect afterwards. So I hope those resources are helpful to you. Yeah, thank you, Bridget. These look awesome. 
And um, I just want to put out there for all of you webinar fans, um, if you want to get involved in making these or creating our Engage newsletter, my friend and colleague, Bonnie Zimmerman, is retiring, and I'm so sad. And she's been just an amazing partner in these webinars, and uh, they, they really aren't going to be the same without her. And we're hiring for her position. Um, so if you live around Olympia and... Uh, you think it might be fun. I hope that you will apply and maybe we could work together. Um, next month, we're gonna be talking about Youth Voice with James Lehman. He's our Director of Student Programs for the Association of Washington Student Leaders and all around nice guy, awesome presenter. Um, and we'll also have with us the 2018 National Teacher of the Year, Mandy Manning on our practitioner panel. It's gonna be really good. Um, and so you can get links and share these out with friends who you think might be interested in learning more about Youth Voice. We do have an evaluation that helps us, uh, let, helps us to know if we're hitting our mark. Um, so I'm gonna put that out right now. Um, if you want like a longer form evaluation, we always are interested in your ideas for speakers, for topics, um, you can give us all of your great thoughts and uh, we always take a look at those as well and so i'm just going to leave this poll open kathy we do have one question in the q a i know ronnie we're good we're about out of time um so uh we would love to see people uh get clock hours for joining us um so if you'd like to get those clock hours please do register in pd enroller PD Enroller will send you an evaluation and we usually confirm your attendance at this live event within a week or so. And if you are watching on YouTube, um, we still ask that you register using PD Enroller and you complete that PD Enroller evaluation. And then if you can fill out our feedback survey, uh, we'll be checking those requests every couple of weeks so we can issue the clock hours from the recordings. And if you have questions about this process, you can email Ronnie Larson. Um, she is our PD Enroller clock hours guru. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, what an inspiration. I hope that we can all protect our peace going into this next